here's our deal. We're gonna come back in five years. <laughs> I think it's possible. I think it's possible. So you think the technology is actually ready? It's actually, it's a funny story. But Talk about that. Like, look at what's happened this week. What do you use an interest rate swap for? Trying to get a job, and I couldn't get a job anywhere. So, because like, you know, a lot of people would just say, get everyone a wallet, and now we'll start, and I'll just ask you that again, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Which is interesting. Regulators aren't gonna love that. <laughs> Interest rate swaps are the most liquid, highly traded assets in the world that almost nobody knows about. We're talking about a quadrillion dollar market each year. Bringing them to the Web3 space and to crypto and to DeFi is a priority that few people have been working on, except for, of course, Simon Jones, the CEO and founder of Volts. We talked about why it's so important that we have these interest rate swaps in DeFi and how that will make the market more efficient and bring DeFi to the world. That's dope. That's dope. And that now we'll start and I'll just ask you that again, basically. Yeah. So, that interest rate swaps are the largest tradable market on the planet, correct? That's right. It's a quadrillion of national exchanged each year in TradFi IRS. Okay, and that's something that completely does not exist it's, in DeFi. It, it, well, it didn't exist until we created it. And, um, we didn't create it because it's the biggest market in the world. We created it because it serves such a massive utility for the whole of the ecosystem. But Talk you, about that. Well, I mean, if we just kind of go back to why we even started Vaults in the first place, like we started it to try and help DeFi become the financial system for the whole world. And in kind of like with that as our North Star, one of the massive problems that we noticed is that DeFi is an ecosystem it is what I would describe as structurally variable. It's actually a byproduct of the technology. I can explain the depth of that to the extent it's helpful, but if we kind of just think about what that means, right? If the ecosystem is only ever variable and actually at times quite volatile, then DeFi is only ever going to be able to serve like a subset of people's financial needs, right? So it's not going to be able to become the financial system for the whole of the world. And what an interest rate swap does, it does many things, but it just at the most macro level, it enables you to transition from something that's variable to something that's stable and therefore enables stability to exist in the ecosystem. And what that means is it means that DeFi can actually now start serving the financial needs of the whole of the world. So it effectively takes an extremely inefficient market and makes it more efficient? It, it takes an extremely variable market and enables stability to exist. And, and why is that? Like, what, what is it inherently about an interest rate swap versus any other sort of product that does that for the market? Yeah, so an interest rate swap enables you to basically exchange like a variable rate for a fixed rate or, or vice versa. You can go from fixed rate to a variable. Um, so with obviously a fixed rate of return, whether that be a fixed rate of yield, whether that be a fixed borrowing cost, that kind of means that you have inherent certainty and therefore stability and like enabling that to exist across the whole ecosystem i come back to this point that actually means that we can serve or start serving the financial needs of billions of people around the world and do you think then that you can take that quadrillion market and bring it into DeFi, or is this a parallel sort of system offering something that's proven there to help build DeFi? I think there's two parts. I think that there's, uh, like, at least in terms of what we're doing at Vaults, uh, long term, we want to displace all of the trading volume that goes through centralized exchanges. We want all of that to go through Vaults. So long term, we want that quadrillion to go through Vaults protocol. But then at the same time, there's not just displacing what already exists. There's actually, like, growing, like, what, like, like DeFi as a sector itself, right? And one of the things which, like, just to lean into that, right? Like, there's, uh, a number that always surprises me, which is that 25% of the world's population don't even have a bank account, right? And that's 1.6 billion people. And what DeFi enables is like for the first time ever, it enables everybody to have the same access to financial services. So when we think about the growth of that kind of part of like what we want to do long term, right? Like actually the opportunity there is massive and that um, has the opportunity to change the lives of billions of people. So the first principle for you is really People are unbanked, underbanked. We need to service them. And that's how you sort of backed into interest rates, interest rate swaps as being a key way to make that happen. Because like, you know, a lot of people would just say, get everyone a wallet. Yeah. Send them some Bitcoin or some USDT and they're banked. Yeah. Right. Sometimes kind of just gets forgotten. I think it's like compared DeFi to TradFi, 
right? Like, so why do we need DeFi in the first place? And actually, if you just look at traditional finance, I think what's clear from traditional finance is that it does not work for the majority of people. Um, so you as an individual, whether you're kind of an emerging economy, whether you're in kind of a kind of a Western economy, you're fundamentally not in control, right? So in the West, for example, there are structures in traditional finance that are deliberately opaque, such that there is an informational advantage, right? That puts you in a position where you are not in control, right? And th another example of that um, is actually central banks. Like, look at what's happened this week. I, I don't even want to get into the decision whether rate rise is right or wrong, but like, what say did you have in that decision? You had no say in it. Right. So you as an individual, you're in traditional finance, you're not in control, right? And what DeFi enables is it enables you to be in control. It puts the user at the center and builds for the user. It gives the user ownership, right, over like the structures that are being created and therefore like enables you for the first time ever to actually have full control over your financial, like your financial lives. And the direct comparison that I'd make actually is think about freedom of speech, right? Like freedom of speech is something which we all in the West fight tooth and nail for. Right? It's like a cornerstone of just modern society. And I find it crazy that we fight tooth and nail for freedom of speech, but we're just willing to accept we do not have financial freedom. And what DeFi enables is it enables financial freedom to exist for everybody across the world. And us at like Vaults and kind of why we came into kind of creating this protocol, we kind of had that as our North Star. Like, let's find a way of helping DeFi become the financial system for the whole of the world. And that's where we kind of landed on this massive problem, which is that the ecosystem is, is structurally variable. And if it remains variable and volatile, we won't be able to serve the financial needs of billions of people. Well, Jerome Powell definitely did not call me and ask for my opinion no. on his uh, interest rate decision or if he was going to be dovish or hawkish in his tone and all the other absurdities that you sort of just hinted to. So where are we then in the evolution of DeFi now from what you've seen as this variable unusable sort of platform that's really tailored for just the few who understand the technology or are willing to take the risk to it being a complete either replacement or a complement, but with the same sort of benefits as the legacy systems. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's, DeFi has been around for like a couple of years, really. It's nothing. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's, it, I mean, it's incredibly nascent as an ecosystem. So there's, there's so many more problems that we need to solve in order for DeFi to actually be able to be used by billions of people. Um, uh, but like we're still early. And, and I think what's so amazing about what's taken place over the past couple of years is it's been an environment where you can experiment a lot, where we can experiment, we can come up with these new mechanism designs, we can come up with these new governance structures, um, all of which is kind of focused ultimately on uh, coming out to this point, putting the user at the center and building for the user. Um, there's a lot more to go. Uh, clearly, but like by having stability in the ecosystem, that actually means that we are able to start building products and services that serve the financial needs of billions of people. What about the idiosyncratic risk, though, of that stability that are well beyond the financial controls that you're talking about? Like, for example, blockchain goes offline, you know, and, and you literally can't transact, or the technological problems, or that you know that can't scale. Right now, we don't have a blockchain that can trans that can you know confirm enough transactions for a billion people to be using it for example it's true. so how much are you at the sort of whim of the technology itself but i think the technology will continue to evolve right like and i think it's arguably fine that that's the case at the moment right because we're, we're not at the point where seven we don't billion, need it yeah right. seven billion people aren't using DeFi as a financial system as of today but we are at the point where now that coming back to now that we have stability now that you actually have the ability to use it for a much broader spectrum of financial needs, where right? like what I want to start to see happening is more and more people coming in around the world and using it as the ecosystem, at which point, like we have to solve these other, but there's lots of problems that need to be solved. And that's one of them, right? Like, and we need to um, get to a place where DeFi can, from a technical perspective as well, like cater to 7 billion people. What were you doing before this? This is my third startup. Uh, so the first two were like more traditional Web2 businesses. Uh, and then obviously this is the third and all of them have been focused on 
trying to democratize access to financial services. So why then the first one? You, there was obviously an aha moment for you when you <laughs> yeah. said, I need to democratize financial services, right? And so you're on your third iteration perhaps of that, but what was that first spark? Yeah, so it's actually, it's a funny story. I need to take you all the way back to 2009. Right, so I, it's not so far for me. <laughs> I'm I'm 45, so yeah, we yeah. go back to when I was in my 30s. <laughs> yeah, um, but no. So in 2009, it's pretty young man. I was actually it's pre-university, so I was living in Australia. I was actually playing rugby out there, and um, I got into university to study architecture. I had absolutely no intention of ever going into financial services, and then I was out there with very little money, trying to get a job, and I couldn't get a job anywhere. And I remember this moment, there's uh, basically all my friends went to Melbourne for the weekend, I was living in Sydney, and I sat there with my like massive bag of $1 pasta, like eating it, like with no sauce, you know, just like kind of really just, yeah, there. yeah, like just classic person with very little money at that kind of age. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I need to do something about this. And that's when I started kind of researching uh, kind of in more detail what was going on in the world. It's the middle of the global financial crisis, right? And there's, it wasn't, clearly it wasn't just me that was affected. There's millions of people that were affected. Lots of people being made unemployed. Uh, lots of people losing their jobs. Uh, kind of governments bailing out banks, all this type of stuff. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, I need to do something about this. Um, and that's when I kind of switched whilst I was in, uh, kind of in Australia, I switched from architecture to economics. And then coming out the other side, I actually went on to set up three different startups. That's a pretty incredible story. And so how frustrating is it you now to see us in another potential global recession <laughs> only, you know, 13 years after they solved that one? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to like, I mean, e economies are going to have cycles. Uh, and unfortunately, we're transitioning, like, we, you know, we're kind of going through the next cycle. But I think like when we're thinking about DeFi, right, think about everybody around the world, what we actually also do have now, which we didn't have in the last cycle, is we have uh, like technology and infrastructure, which actually has the potential to change the lives of billions of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people who love to say, you know, in 2008, there was no Bitcoin, yeah. so you can't blame them as much. But now they should have their eyes open and see this as another option. Did you find Bitcoin first or was it straight to DeFi? It was, uh, so 2012, I got introduced to Bitcoin. Oh, so you've been around yeah. a while. Uh, but then it, for me, it was always about the technology, which is why I went to do these other two startups. And then coming into last year, I was just, uh, sorry, coming into 2020, I was like, um, like technology is clearly ready for mass market adoption. And that's why I left my last, last startup and kind of went and set up Vault. So you think the technology is actually ready? I think it is, yeah. Like, I think it is. I think, I think we can start to um, use it in ways which uh, or, or kind of enable people to use it in ways where it's actually serving a kind of meaningful purpose in their day-to-day -day lives. So uh, we haven't even talked about specifically, like granularly, what Volts does. So yeah. how does it actually use interest uh, rate swaps? Yeah, so we created um, like an automated market maker for interest rate swaps. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, kind of like things under the hood going on from an architectural perspective. Um, but one of the things that we really wanted to solve for uh, was both uh, capital efficiency, which is incredibly important when trading rates, um, but then also making sure the protocol is as composable as possible. And to kind of explain that point, right, interest rate swaps in traditional finance, like I said, it's a quadrillion a year. It's like insanely big. But if you go to anybody on the street here and say, have you heard of an interest rate swap? Yeah, yeah, there's a chance that, like, well, we're in New York, so there's a chance that you might meet someone that does, but. We need to go a little further downtown. <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a high likelihood that they don't have a clue. But if you say, do you know what a fixed rate mortgage is? You can guarantee that they'll know what that is. And what's actually happening in the background is um, kind of the kind of bank or whatever that you're taking that mortgage from they are in the background using super low level capital markets infrastructure, i.e. interest rate swaps, to package that product up for you. So when we're creating vaults, we wanted the protocol to exist fully on chain, such that it was composable to the point that lots of people could start building products on top of it. Um, and that's now, what's really interesting is we're now starting to see that take place. There's, there's loads of teams that have come through that have noticed that we've created this new market in DeFi for the first time and they're starting to build new products on top of it. So you consider yourself somewhat a base layer 
for the ability for others to innovate and build on top of it. I think it, it, Vaults is a very, very low level primitive for DeFi. Yeah, for sure. So when do we get fixed rate mortgages in DeFi then? This, this, yeah, like I'm, I'm excited to see that happen. Right, honestly, and I think it will happen. Within the next few years, I think that there's going to be, like we already have real world assets on chain. Like USDC is, is like a real world asset that's just replicated on chain. Um, so if we can start having ways of doing that for kind of more assets that exist in the so-called real world, like why can't we start doing that for mortgages? And at that point, we can have fixed rate mortgages on chain. Yeah, I think, and it comes up repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly in these conversations, just because I think of where the timing of where we are sort of in the evolution of this technology, but feels like we could tokenize everything. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we could definitely find a way of replicating assets that exist in the real, so-called real economy, which I really don't like that phrase, but anyway, in, in like, in the so-called real economy, we can definitely find a way of replicating those and, um, uh, kind of putting them on chain. At which point then you can have fixed rate mortgages off the back of it. But don't we sort of backing into that conversation, interest rate swaps are a quadrillion plus market because of fixed rate mortgages. And that's sort of the plumbing for what's happening behind. Yeah. You're coming at it actually in the opposite direction, right? You're presenting the interest rate swap first, but do we need the fixed rate mortgages and all of those things for volts to then be necessary? We need volts needs to exist now in order for DeFi to have stability. Right, like, and with that existing in the ecosystem, people can then start building products on top of that, which includes the likes of fixed rate mortgages. But if you didn't have that, then you would only ever have the ability to create a variable mortgage, right, right with DeFi. And, and actually, like, given the volatility of the ecosystem at times, like, arguably that would not serve the utility that someone wants in Get, order to buy Getting that. liquidated is probably not that much fun when, yeah, when, when it's your house. When it's your house. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Are there other things that you're seeing built right now that are really exciting to you? There's a really massive spectrum, um, which actually in itself is exciting. There's people doing kind of relatively simple things in the grand scheme of things like fixed rate vaults. Um, not vaults as in us, no, but vaults, a yeah, vault, absolutely. yeah. Um, all the way through to actually more, uh, kind of like complicated stuff, like swaptions, um, and actually some like degeny stuff, like using, uh, uh, fixed rates as a form of stable coin collateralization, um, which is interesting. Regulators aren't going to love that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to just uh, steer away from the term stablecoin and start calling anything that's not like USD backed and over collateralized something else so that they don't uh, pay as much attention to us. It's a, it's a, an asset that replicates a single dollar. Right? Yeah. Like, but don't, like don't, the, the, the term stablecoin now has become like a four letter word, uh, unfortunately, for the regulators. So do you see DeFi eventually eating everything or do you think that it becomes a parallel rail for all of those people you talked about who don't have access. I think there's going to be a spectrum, right? Like I, do I think Goldman Sachs is just going to disappear? Like I think it's unlikely. But will Goldman Sachs come on chain and perhaps realize that the only way for them to evolve is to I, be in DeFi? Well, so I, I kind of, if you think about your financial stack, right? Like I kind of think about DeFi as backend disruption. And actually what we've had arguably of the past 20 years is with fintech is front-end disruption of that whole stack. So I think DeFi has the potential to um, both become a financial system that anybody can come into, and maybe they're coming into that through fintech, maybe they're coming into that directly. And it also has the potential to wedge itself into like traditional finance. And coming up to this point from the start, right? Um, London Clearinghouse, obviously as a Brit, I kind of enjoy talking about this. London Clearinghouse, entity based in London, um, it's responsible for 90% of the world's interest rate swap clearing. And in five years time, we don't want that to exist as an entity. Because in order for that to function as an entity, they have to employ thousands of people, right? In order to employ those thousands of people, they have to pay them salaries. Where does the salaries come from? It comes from charging fees in order for people to trade, right? So effectively, what you have is you have this rent right, coming out of the system, right, in order to pay all of these people to manage that exchange. And what you can do with a smart contract is you can get rid of the need for all of those people. So it's actually like a positive for all of the traders and therefore everybody that uses that as a low level building block. So even, even if like, you know, we want DeFi to grow and obviously we kind of really care about making that happen. But we also want to wedge ourselves 
into traditional finance and displace these centralized exchanges. Yeah, I mean, I think the core ethos of crypto for most people is eliminating third party rent collectors from, yeah. from our transactions. But five years, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty optimistic and aggressive, but five years seems pretty, pretty fast. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I mean, we already so you kind of just play out how's that going to happen. Like at the moment, we're super focused on being like the interest rate swap exchange for the metaverse, so to speak, like just be very DeFi focused. And there's been loads of trading activity. We've been only been live for three and a half months and we've been growing 50 percent or 40 to 50 percent each week. Right. So there's, there's pretty good growth there. And there's now lots of people coming in that are building on top of the protocol. When those teams go live, that will drive more trading activity is great. But what we want to do next, right, and there's no timeline on this, but what the next step is then to start to replicate traditional financial rates on chain, such that you can have these TradFi rate markets, but they're like existing in a decentralized environment. And off the back of creating that, we'll slowly over time start to bring the TradFi players, who at the moment are paying all these fees in order to use a centralized exchange, bring them onto a decentralized exchange where like the fundamentals of the exchange that they're interacting with are like orders of magnitude better than the, what they get through a centralized exchange. You talk about 50% month over month growth. Are those interest rate swap traders from the real world that are coming in? Or are these, maybe it's someone in between, are these like degenerate BitMEX perpetual swap Bitcoin traders who are seeing another asset that they can basically, you know, uh, gamble on? There's, there's a spectrum, right? And I think actually it's, it's, it's an interesting question because like, what do you use an interest rate swap for? Um, and I think for the most part, there's three main use cases. There's speculation, there's uh, hedging of risk, right? And then there's the, using it for product construction, which is both for retail, like mortgages, and it's actually for corporates, like structured products. So that product construction at the moment, we've got like a bunch of teams building stuff Right, that's going to go live in the coming, or some of them are start, going to start going live in the coming months, which will be exciting. Then in the other two, there have been people who have been using vaults to hedge risk, right? Um, uh, so that could be kind of something as simple as a CFI lending desk where uh, they're promising kind of rates, fixed rates to their consumers, and they're lending it out at a variable rate. So on their balance sheet, they've got this rate liability, and they can now hedge that on chain. And then alongside that, you've got speculators. Right. And some of those speculators are, I think, degens. Right. And then alongside that, I think a lot of those speculators are actually like sophisticated trading firms who trade rates in traditional finance. They can now start doing it on chain too. And how do you get all of them trading on chain? On, on vaults? Yeah. Um, we need DeFi to become the financial system for the whole of the world. Right. Like we need, we need the, the spectrum of use cases that DeFi can support to be widened, right? And that's where I come back to this product construction point. We need lots of products to be built on top of vaults. And when there are lots of products, right, that creates the opportunity for trading activity to exist, right, for kind of all of the sophisticated trading firms to start coming in. I mean, we're literally talking about replacing the biggest and most powerful systems on the planet. Not gonna let go easily. Well, I like the, are they letting go? I, like, I don't know if I'd, like the, the centralized exchange, like f fine, like they, they could get displaced. I mean, that happens time and time and time again when new technology comes along, right? Like, yeah, I'm just like, talking more about the banks, the credit card companies, the they, centralized they, platforms you're talking about. But they, they can still come in and operate right. on DeFi. Like they can still use DeFi as part of their financial stack. So. It's more, it's more that kind of base layer of infrastructure which has the opportunity to be displaced. So here's our deal. We're going to come back in five years. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do this again and we're going to see if we've replaced it. I, I can completely support what you're doing. I believe that it will eat everything personally. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard not to just play devil's advocate and ask those questions because... Let's see. I mean, like, I, honestly, I think the fundamentals are strong. I think these things can at times happen a lot quicker than people think. Right. If you have like exponential growth is something which you kind of struggle with as yeah. like humans, right? Um, uh, so like honestly, five year horizon, that's what we're shooting for. All right. Well, let's uh, do it again in five, five years, years, hopefully before, man. Thank you so much. Really, really <laughs> been uh, awesome. inspiring, excited to see what you guys build. Thanks. It's been awesome to be here.